Well, my name is Shane. I just, uh, if you are here, we want to dismiss you. If you're uh, in uh, first grade and under, you can go to Children's Church. Um, and my name is Shane. I'm the pastor here at First Baptist Church, and we want to welcome you. And I just want to point out that this week is a very, very exciting week. I don't know if you guys noticed, but we got tents out over here in parking lot. We got some uh, RVs getting ready. We got groups that are about ready to come in for the purpose of sharing the gospel in the, in the, on the reservation. And we got kids coming together. They're going to be uh, teaching kids about Jesus. And so we just, can we as a congregation say amen? We got things going on and we're so thankful for the teams, uh, the leaders coming in. Uh, that are going to be leading those teams as, as uh, we just want to pray. In fact, would you just bow your heads with me? We want to be a congregation who prays. Would you pray with me? Lord Jesus, we pray that your power would go out uh, in these groups and that your word would, would go out and that many uh, would hear and believe and God, that they would be added to the fold, uh, that they would be saved. God, that you would take them from the kingdom of darkness and put them into the kingdom of your beloved son. So Lord, we pray a great favor over the mission teams coming in this week. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. Well, uh, we are going through a, a new series, kind of our summer series uh, for us as a church. It's a lot about what is our function? What are we supposed to be about as the church? So we're calling it our scope our scope. And here's our vision for making disciples, as we know is our charge from Scripture, in Fremont County. We want to be a church about the book, amen? So we want to be a church about Scripture. We want to be a body of believers that are all about the teaching of the Word of God. And so we want to be about Scripture. And we're going to be, this is uh, going to be our close to that part of scripture today. And then next week, we're going to be jumping into community. What does the word of God tell us about how we are to function as a community of redeemed believers? And then after that, we're going to talk about what does the scripture say about how we're to outreach or reach into our community, our surrounding peak community, and how are we to serve? How are we to serve? And then we're going to be talking about the purpose of praise in God's church. And we just, we encountered that, but what is, what is the, the purpose of worship and praise in the church? What's the role uh, that that serves? And then we're going to talk about evangelism to finish um, in the fall, and that should open us up then just in time for us to get going with the new school year. So that's kind of our trajectory, our path for the next few weeks. I got a question for you uh, as we begin to consider uh, the, the scripture is this. Anybody remember a few years ago when a lot of people got checks in the mail from the government? It was called stimulus. You guys remember those? Do you remember uh, all of a sudden there were different salesmen, RV salesmen in particular, where it was like they couldn't keep campers on the lot? You guys remember that? And it was like uh, motorcycles, all the toys. You had jet skis, motorcycles. People were using the stimulus typically to buy new toys, weren't they? And we saw that big time. Have you ever noticed then um, in the last year to two years, as I look online, there's a lot of now gently used campers for sale on Facebook. Anybody seen that? or gently used jet skis, or gently used ATVs. And it's like, everybody got really excited about this cash, and what did they do in the midst of that? They went and they bought some toys, and then they realized those toys take maintenance, those toys take care, they take time, they take energy, and so they kind of didn't get an opportunity to use them probably as much as they thought. Anybody there? Anybody guilty? Can we just be honest? Well, I think a lot of us tend to treat the Bible the same way, where we get a big fancy study Bible, and we know it's really thick, and we have that thing, and we maybe even sometimes parade around our arm when we're trying to, you know, get some good workout in. 
But a lot of us don't open and do the work and don't enjoy the, the benefits of what has been handed to us in God's word. And I think um, it reminded me of a few years ago, um, I, I, your pastor's gonna confess a little bit to you. Um, during the, the COVID season, I thought I was going to try to be a, a YouTube star. And so I went and purchased a bunch of really expensive camera ex, uh, equipment, or expensive for me anyway. And I was gonna become, I was gonna start doing YouTube videos and I, I got into it, I got the right equipment and then I just never got to it. I just never had the time to put into it. Man, many of us, I think, fall into that same treatment of the word of God, don't we? We have Bibles, we have more access to God's word today than, we, than any other generation before us. We have access to the very voice of God. I want you to look here, if you got your Bibles, turn to John 10. John 10, verses 25 through 28. John 10, verses 25 through 28. Oh, you hear that sound, that sweet sound of pages turning. And uh, if you got your device, that warm glow that just lights up your face with the, the glow of God's word. John 10, 25 says this. My sheep, this is Jesus speaking. My sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. I give them eternal life and they will never perish and no one will snatch them out of my hand. So there's this principle in scripture that Jesus has given us is that if we are one of the flock of Jesus, then we know how to hear his voice. We can hear his voice. Now for us, we know that the voice of God, the best way for us to hear God's word is through the scriptures. We've been going through that. But today I wanna, I wanna give us a few really practical tips on how to read the Bible. And here you're like, Pastor, we've spent three weeks on how did we get the Bible? Why can we trust the Bible? Today we're gonna talk about how can we read the Bible in a way to receive God's word and his intention for us today. So we're gonna go through how do we read the Bible? The reason I wanna do this is because if we become a group of people that can hear the voice of God, that can understand his voice and hear him, is that is that kind of a big deal? Yeah. You don't need a celebrity pastor. You don't need the, the world's best Bible teachers. They're helpful, but you have access. You have ears to hear if you pick up a Bible, the very voice of God. And this is what can make us as a congregation oh, impactful in our community and a disciple-making community. So, um, anybody ever given somebody a Bible? How do, when you give somebody a Bible, do you just kind of throw it at them, say, good luck? Anybody ever done that? <laughs> Maybe some of us like accidentally, <laughs> you know, like, um, no, when we give the Bible, it's probably helpful to kind of, where do we start? So my question is, if you were to give somebody a Bible today, where would you tell them to start? Where would you tell them to start? Did anybody ever hand you a Bible? Where did they tell you to start? Did they say, open the first page? Did they tell you anything? Hey, okay, I heard it. So my counsel, typically to people when I hand them a Bible, where do I start? I want them to start with Jesus first and then unpack the rest of the scriptures. And so I will tell them typically to start in the New Testament with Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John because those are the eyewitness accounts of the most important event in all history was the life, death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. And so I will tell people, read the book of John. Uh, if I give people a Bible, I say, start with the book of John, and I want you to ask the question, who is this man Jesus? Okay, put that one in your back pocket. If you give somebody a Bible, don't just throw it to them in their face. Don't huck it like a football. But sit down with them and say, hey, this is unlike most books. You don't just start at the first page. You can, but it might be helpful to get the context of Jesus first. 
Um, well, how should we read? When you encourage somebody to sit down and read the Bible, what, how, how would you encourage them? Should they sit down and just kind of like set the Bible on their desk and just kind of maybe shake their desk a little bit and then ruffle the pages and then open their eyes and then kind of do the like finger closing thing? Like, okay, here's the verse I'm reading today. Anybody guilty of doing that, by the way? You ever done that? Okay, it, it can do, it can, it can sometimes by God's grace, it can reveal incredible truth at a, at a pretty clutch moment. But sometimes, <laughs> and maybe most of the time, you can get like the passage on the she bear eating kids. And you'd be like, uh, God, what are you trying to tell me here? Right? So maybe not always the best way to encounter scripture. By God's grace, sometimes he can reveal truth that way. But my encouragement to us is to sit down and to actually commit ourselves to reading a full portion of scripture. We talked about last week that the chapters and the numbers, how scripture was broken up, was added like 1,200 years later after we were, after we had the word of God. So originally those, where the passages break up, where the chapters break, those didn't exist in the beginning when we had scripture. And so the sense is when you had a scroll, which it was written on scrolls, you would sit down and you would read top to bottom that whole scroll. So that's important for us today. How many of you like to just read a chapter or a snippet or a heading, right? And so you think about if we just take things out of context, are we going to get the full picture? or the full purpose of those passages. Um, by the way, I was, I, this week, God always gives me a great illustration. I was talking to my son, and I asked my son, we're sitting there, I was like, hey, uh, son, I don't want you to go and to eat more ice cream. And he says, okay, dad. He looks at me, he shakes his head yes, and he walks over to the freezer, and he starts getting the ice cream out. He starts opening it up, he puts it in a bowl. He comes over to me, he's like, Thanks, Dad. I was like, what are you doing? I just told you not to do. You are literally doing the opposite of what I told you to do. And he goes, well, I just heard you say, eat ice cream. <laughs> we had a laugh after that. I was like, I thought you were just being super rebellious. He's like, no, I just heard what I wanted to hear. You see what I'm saying? A lot of us, when we open the word of God, we open the Bible, we like to just hear the things we like to hear, don't we? We don't like to be challenged by what God is saying. And so we want to read full portions of the Bible, and we want to make sure that we set up some ground rules, some boundaries, so we don't misinterpret Scripture. By the way, has the Bible been misinterpreted? Pretty significantly, right? pretty significantly in our culture today. Um, and that, I think, in, 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 uh, as I've studied Scripture, the power, uh, we have Romans 1.16, for I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation. It's power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. And so for us, if we just start interpreting Scripture however we want, is it going to lose the power for salvation? I think it can. Again, we talked about the word of God being a sword. If I try to use a full sword to cut butter and put it on toast, it kind of makes that sword seem kind of kind of dumb, right? Kind of ineffective. And I think this is how our culture views scripture because Christians have kind of taken this powerhouse for salvation and manipulated it into little fun phrases and catchphrases and things we can put on t-shirts. And it tells the whole world that the word of God is, you know, it's kind of like, it's quotable, it's tweetable. We can put it on Facebook. So let's, let's go through, today I just want to unpack what are some boundaries, what are some ways that we can encounter scripture uh, in a way that we're not going to misuse it. So what, so one question when we open the word of God that we need to, to ask is, what does scripture actually say? Okay, what does it actually say? Why is this important in today's culture? Well, because there's a lot of hearsay about what Scripture actually says. Have you ever had somebody say, well, that's in the Bible somewhere? What should your response be? 
show me. Help me understand. Help me understand. Where did you see that in Scripture? Because, man, there's a lot of sayings that are flying around out there, misquotes, and we're going to look at some really funny misquotes um, that are taken out of context here in a little bit. But that's really dangerous. It's really important for us. What does Scripture actually say? And for us as readers, when we encounter God's word, it's really important that we don't fall into uh, a mistake of under-reading Scripture. Here's what I mean by that. How many of you have read a full page or uh, a full book of the Bible, and you go back and you're like, I have no idea what I just heard? Anybody there? So I want you to think about when that happened, what was your environment like? Was it loud? Were there distractions? Did you get away to encounter? Uh, I think it's interesting. What would you say is the most captivating thing in our culture today? In our society? Social media, okay. Have you seen how fixated people get with social media? Right? They're like, they're leaning in so much so that they completely forget that there's people in front of them. You know you've seen teenagers doing this. Adults, let's be honest, you've done this too, right? It's like everything fades to black except that little screen. There's an intention. There's a focus there. I was also thinking movie theaters. What do they do in movie theaters when you sit down? There's that little thing that, says on, that comes on and it says, remove any distractions. And then the lights come down. And it says, make sure that you turn your phones off. Isn't it funny that the world gets this principle, that if you're going to truly get something for its beauty, you have to eliminate everything else so that you can encounter it in its true form. For us, the Bible is no different. If we're going to hear the word of God, we have to get to a place where we try to eliminate distractions. For some of us, that might be what's going on. Anybody have the, like, you can't control your mind and the thoughts get going crazy and you can't calm down? That might be a great opportunity when you encounter God's word in order to not underread scripture. And by underread, I mean miss what is there through lack of attention or intention. That, it, that means that we just have to try to make sure that we focus on scripture. Parents, this is really hard. I'm, I'm a parent of littles. I got an infant right now. This is difficult, isn't it? This requires some sacrifice, doesn't it? Sometimes this means you got to get up before your kids are awake. My kids, man, they keep getting up earlier and earlier and earlier. Sometimes that might mean for your spouse that, that you sit down with your kids and you give, I tell my wife, hey, can you go outside, go and read scripture. I'm gonna, I got the kids. You need to go and you need to hear from our Lord. And we'll do that for one another. So there's a sense that we try to make sure that's a priority, that we eliminate distractions. <clears throat> do you take notes? Any note takers out there? Anybody never taken notes? They're like, I got this. I can remember everything. I have a photographic memory, right? I, here's a, I could take you in my iPad. I have probably 10 years now of notes on scripture and on my studies and on sermons that I can go back and I reflect. Um, I was taking notes this morning and notes continue to help us take those truths and sink them deeper into our hearts. So let me encourage you, let's be a note-taking church. And by the way, doodles are accepted in your notes by this pastor. You know why? There's sometimes I can remember God's truth in my journals because I had a doodle that went along with what I was hearing or a little drawing. Any artists out there? I see a couple hands, right? So that's great. Take notes because remember, we have parables like the sower of truth. And as soon as the seed of truth is laid on these different types of ground, what happens? The weeds come and they choke it out or Satan comes and tries to pluck those truths out. Um, and so there's this sense that we have to, if we encounter the word of God, it's almost like we have to be intentional in grabbing it and holding on to it. How many of you have walked out of a sermon that you were like, that was amazing. And then that, that afternoon, somebody said, hey, what did you learn in the sermon? And you go, uh, I don't know. I don't know. There's this intentionality that we need to come out with scripture so that we don't miss what it actually says. 
And we need to spend time remembering, put it into your long-term memory, right? Maybe as soon as you walk out here asking the question, what did I just, uh, and I used to do this as a youth pastor, it always amazed me. I would go through, for many years, I was like, man, I'm really teaching God's truth. And then I started asking my students afterwards, hey, what did you take away from that? And they're like, I think you told me to go and ask that girl out. This was what the junior high boys would tell me. And I'm like, that is nothing to do with the book of Genesis at this point, right? Right? That is not what I said. That is not what I said. But that's what their takeaway was. So I started doing, and I can't do this in this setting with church, just go and like at the end of the sermon, can you imagine if I just went and I called your name and I was like, okay, what was your one takeaway from today's sermon? I can't do that. Sometimes I'd like to just to make sure that we're clinging to the truth that God's giving us in his word. But we should do that when we encounter his word, when we're reading. So take notes. So that's under reading that we miss because of lack of attention or intention. This means being intentional. You guys remember the word intentional means on purpose. Do you encounter God's word on purpose? Okay, and so the other thing that we tend to do uh, mistakenly that causes us not to understand what Scripture actually says is we overread. We overread. This means that we put our preconceived ideas, our opinions, and our perspectives into the text. Okay? So Republicans and Democrats didn't exist at the time of the writing of Scripture. Can we agree on that? right? The uh, U.S. politics, it didn't exist. But many of us, when we open the word of God, I had a guy one time tell me, uh, he used a verse in Proverbs that he was like, the right is always right and don't turn to the left. And I was like, I don't think he was thinking about the right politically or the left politically when he wrote that verse. Right? But we have a tendency to put those preconceived ideas and opinions and perspectives into the text. This is called, uh, amongst Bible scholars, called eisegesis. Everybody say it with me, eisegesis. And eisegesis is when you take a scripture and you force it to your own context. You make it mean something that it wasn't intended to mean. And so we have to be really careful as your pastor. I have to be really careful that I don't take the word of God and I make it say something that it wasn't intended to say. And I use the example of the ice cream, but have you ever had somebody take something you said out of context or just heard what they wanted to hear? How does that make you feel? Kind of frustrated, right? Kind of frustrated. I wonder... You know, for all the many people that take the Bible out of context, um, what does that do with the Lord? I'm going to see, uh, I, I want to truly encounter the Bible then for what it says. I don't want to take my preconceived notions or assumptions about it. So for us to encounter what does Scripture actually say, we have to approach the Word of God humbly. We need to read the text to hear from God, not say what we want it to say. Okay? How many of you, like, this is really, like, this is not rocket science, pastor, but how many of you, like, humbly encountering Scripture is really hard? Well, here's a, here's a little test for you. How many of you have ever active listened to somebody where they're talking to you? And they do this thing uh, in, sometimes in classes, like communications classes. But uh, when you're active listening to somebody, what are you doing? You're leaning in. You're leaning in and what are you doing? You're looking at them and you're focused. Anybody tried to do that and get exhausted? <laughs> like that's a lot of work. So what's the opposite of humbly reading scripture or humbly listening to somebody? Active, the opposite of active communicate or active listening, we call it, would be this number, right? Or leaning back. Anybody ever tried to talk to somebody when they're like leaning back and they got their their legs kicked back and they look super relaxed? You don't feel like they're paying attention, right? See, there's kind of this idea that even our posture, when we come to the Word of God, when we look at the Bible, 
man, don't lay in a hammock and look up this way. Anybody fall asleep? Or you're like, I read scripture all the time, but I do it in bed, pastor. But I fall asleep somewhere in the middle of the reading. Anybody do that? Um, see, our posture, I mean, we want to get into it. So we got to take that posture. We got to prepare. We want to humbly encounter the word of God. This means exegesis. So eisegesis is when we put our own meaning into the word of God. Exegesis, everybody say that with me, exegesis, is when we look to scripture to define scripture. It says something, and the author, the Holy Spirit, has an intention. He wants to say something to us, and so we need to be active listening to what he's saying. <clears throat> Here's an example. Um, uh, one of the things, I, I just kind of as a, as a tagline, what does the Scripture actually say? Um, I always think about, uh, anybody have a problem with sometimes taking things too literally? or not literally enough. It always makes me think of, there's a, a show, Guardians of the Galaxy, where there's a guy who's like, he's just completely literal. He takes everything literal. And somebody says, yeah, that's going to go over his head. And he goes, no, it wouldn't. I would catch it. And so sometimes when we approach scripture, um, there's narrative and there's also poetry. There's also logical sequence of ideas. An example of this would be Psalms 98.1. It says, the right hand, uh, his right hand in his holy arm have worked salvation for him. And so, like, we've, we've talked about this. Other religions sometimes will take that to mean that, like Mormons, for example, take this to believe that God the Father has a literal body. But we have other passages in Scripture that tell us that God does not have a physical, literal body like we have right? Um, that he is spirit, is that we worship him in spirit and in truth. And so there's poetry that's describing the things or the character of God that we sometimes need to navigate. Is this poetry? Is this narrative? Is this logical sequence of ideas? What is the scripture actually trying to say? The next thing for us is what does scripture mean? What is scripture trying to say? What's the big idea? Everybody say this with me. What's the big idea? What's the big idea? This is really important for us. We need to ask, what is the author's intent? What is the intent of the author? See, this is a difference between a finding attitude and a seeking attitude. I'm going to just kind of elaborate on this. A seeking attitude says, I want to discover, Lord, what you have to say. What does a finding attitude say? I want to look to find this truth because I know I'm right. Okay? When we approach the Bible looking to prove ourselves right, that's a dangerous place to be. How many of you, as we've talked about, Jeremiah tells us that we are capable of infinite self-deceit. What does that mean? Nobody has lied to you more than you have lied to you. And so we're really good at lying to ourselves, even about what Scripture says. And so we need to have a seeking attitude. God, teach me. Instead of a finding attitude, I want to be right. Um, for us then, what's the big idea? Context. This is an important word. Context, 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 context. There should be a praise song about context. That would be awesome. Can you imagine singing that? What does context mean? Well, we need to look at the immediate context, the immediate context of a passage. It's okay to read a sentence over and over and over until you understand it. That's important, isn't it? And then, so that's immediate context. And then you look, well, what's the context of the passage? Maybe it's the chapter. Maybe there's a segment within the book. And what's the context? What's the purpose of the whole book? What's the immediate context and then the context of the book? And then what is the global context? How does this truth fit into the whole counsel of Scripture? Is our God infinitely wise? Anybody here infinitely wise? So does that mean that sometimes there's going to be some nuances and some intricacies in God's Word that's going to take some laboring for us? The answer is yes. 
And for us to understand then the global context of Scripture, and we don't just rip out little sentences or little phrases, but we read it in its context. And there's also a historical context, meaning that there's cultural context. There was a people that this was written to within the context of that time that it was written. Um, anybody ever heard the phrase, great minds think alike? You heard that phrase? I guarantee you probably haven't heard the whole phrase. You ready? I'm going to give it to you. Great minds think alike, though fools seldom differ. Anybody's main go? <clears throat> Context is pretty important. Somebody liked that first part. Great minds think alike. If you think like me, the whole purpose of that phrase is, if you don't ever think a little differently, then you're probably a fool. Hmm, interesting. How about this one? Nice guys finish last. You ever heard that one? Anybody heard that one? That was actually a misquote by a baseball player. He finished seventh um, and not last. And uh, it was in the context of a baseball game. But many, many people use that phrase to kind of justify themselves and how they behave, right? <laughs> when they don't finish when the way they wanted. How about this one? Curiosity killed the cat. Anybody heard that one? Where are my cat people at? Okay, I see you. And I'm praying for you. <laughs> a joke, a joke. Curiosity killed the cat, but satisfaction brought it back. Do you know that's the original quote to that? Satisfaction brought it back. So what is it saying? It's saying curiosity isn't a bad thing, that curiosity can be worth the cost if you find out what you're curious about. Pretty interesting, huh? But so many of us, man, those are just simple phrases, catchphrases in our culture. How many of us do this to the Bible? Man, all the time, don't we? Take it out of context. Much of the Bible was written to specific people in specific historical situations, Identify the original intent. So we need to ask the question, what was the original intent? Which is not always to answer your question. Anybody have like a big, powerful question that you're like, I want to come to Scripture and I want this question answered? Anybody? Sometimes you can find some pretty incredible things. If you look in context, you can find the answer. But sometimes you're like, I'm reading and I'm reading, and Paul, I hear you talking about sharing the gospel, but it's not answering some of my harder questions, right? So we need to identify the original intent, not just have our questions answered. Here's some, uh, here's some misquoted or taken out of context verses. How many have heard this one? Matthew 18, 20 says, where two or more are gathered, there I am, okay? What happens if you're alone and you're praying? Does that verse mean that Jesus is no longer there with you if you're alone? No. It's this, sometimes that verse is used like, we need to get as many people here so God can hear us. That's just not the purpose of that verse. You know what the context of that verse is? It's not, you're not going to like it. The context of that verse is church discipline. And here Jesus has just unpacked, if a brother sins against you, you should go to them first in, secret, you know, in quiet, in secret, and confront them. And if they don't change, then it says, take two or three with you. And then later on, here Jesus is encouraging, he's saying that if a brother is in sin, you need to take two or three. And you need to remember that you have the authority of Jesus with you when you're confronting a brother in sin. By the way, for the purpose of restoration, not to be right but that's a passage for another day. So Jesus is saying, I'm with you because one of the hardest things, can I get an amen to this? Is confronting a brother or a sister in sin. I think many of us, we had this conversation in our, in our men's study today. Confrontation's hard, isn't it? So Jesus knew that and he said, I need to tell you, I support you in this. Why is our church, so, why are Western churches so weak? Because honestly, we're afraid to love each other enough to confront one another when we're in the wrong. And so we just let things go. 
sweep it under the rug. So where two or more are gathered is taken out of context. Anybody heard this one? Philippians, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I'm going to try really hard to fly right now because I can do all things. Am I flying? Is it working? You're probably not going to see that, right? Because there's this sense that the context of that passage is actually enduring trials for the sake of the gospel. It's not that you can just get really strong or you can be really good on the football field or you can have, I, I don't know, you can eat more hot dogs than anybody else. I don't know. But it is to endure trials. See, the context there is really important. You can endure suffering. Anybody have to endure suffering? Anybody in the midst of suffering that you have to endure? That verse is for you. Matt 7.1, this one's used against Christians all the time. Anybody hear this? You're not supposed to judge me. The Bible says so. Anybody hear that? Anybody said that? Yeah, it kind of sounds like it when it says do not judge, but there's a whole context to that passage, isn't there? What is the context? Take the log out of your own eye before you address the speck in your brother's eye. You see what it did there? So there's this caveat that we actually, it's kind of making the phrase that we are supposed to judge and help one another in that sense, but we just have to be really careful, brothers and sisters, not to be hypocritical. Does that make sense? And I often tell this to churches, say this with me, I am a recovering hypocrite, and you can be too, right? Right? Um, because all of us are there. We are to take the plank out of our own eye before, but that's taken out of context, isn't it? Don't judge me. Brother, I love you enough to say that this is not God's way for you. That's a hard thing to say, isn't it? But man, you can see how damaging then and how weakening God's word is. The power's taken out of it, isn't it? The power's taken out of God's word if we take it out of context. So. Global context, the whole council of scripture, historical context. I want to, uh, I'm just going to give you a quick video and I hope it works, but I just thought this was a great illustration for us. Maybe if it plays. Maybe. Maybe not. Here we go. An event seen from one point of view gives one impression. Seen from another point of view, it gives quite a different impression. But it's only when you get the whole picture you can fully understand what's going on. I know it's super short. It's super simple. Makes a lot of sense, though, doesn't it? Makes a lot of sense. I thought that was kind of a fun illustration out of Britain, um, talking about (laughs) we tend to have these guttural responses when we take these little passages of Scripture, um, or we just have little bits of information that we misuse. So, further, what are, so another question for us is we're engaging God's Word. Are you guys doing okay? This is intensely practical this morning, I know. Um, this, uh, so how to read scripture, what are the timeless principles? Timeless principles. And I don't mean principles of your school or of a school, but I mean, what is a principle? A principle is not necessarily a hard and flat, fast rule. It's not a bylaw, if you will. A principle is kind of like an ideal. It, it, it tells us how we can live Um, It gives us kind of the sense for making uh, important decisions in a moment or feeling out how an event is playing out. 
So here's here's where um, we're going to talk about how do I how do I find out what is the timeless principle of Scripture when we're reading it. Number one, we need to understand that in Scripture there are descriptive events, but a descriptive event is not prescriptive. Is not prescriptive. This will radicalize how you read the Bible if you understand descriptive versus prescriptive. Now, um, descriptive, there's a lot of historical events recorded in Scripture. Would you agree? Okay. There's a lot of historical events recorded in Scripture. Um, I want to I want to tell you what else is recorded in Scripture. Well, did you guys know that there's slavery in the Bible? Did you know there's cannibalism in the Bible? Did you know there's polygamy in the Bible? Did you know there's murder in the Bible? There's genocide in the Bible. There's a gal with a tent peg, and it doesn't go well for another guy. There's a dude with a donkey jaw that kills a bunch of people with a donkey jaw. I said I was going to stop saying dude. Bear with me. I'm, I'm still adjusting. Because those things are in the Bible, it doesn't mean that we should do them. Please, no slavery, no cannibalism, okay? Just avoid tent pegs in any violent sense, okay? But there's this sense that these are recorded events. They're descriptive about how it went down. That doesn't mean that this is how God wants it. Okay, so many times, this is the, the tough part about our Christian culture today, is we get into this idea of how do I teach Christian living principles out of Scripture? And so we take the Old Testament and we begin to, to add on to these stories. They were descriptive events, but then we got like, here's the life lesson out of these descriptive events. We have to be very careful about that. You have to be very, very careful about not just viewing David and Goliath. Here's an example, right? Everybody loves the idea of themselves being David and the problems in their life are Goliath. And they're going to overcome their giants. Anybody been told that? What's the context of that scripture, right? It's a historical event to foreshadow the coming of Christ, Jesus, who would overcome the giant of sin in our life. We're not the heroes of the Bible, right? The context of the Old Testament, Jesus taught it on the road to Emmaus. The Bible and the Old Testament is about him. And so if you start trying to look at the life of Elijah, by the way, there's different prophets that uh, um, one guy was told to bury his underwear. I don't suggest doing that to communicate the word of God, unless God asks you directly right? There's another guy that was told to cook bread over poop, okay? Don't go home and have lunch that way, okay? Because those are descriptive events about how it was time fixed and it was a message to Israel. Now, timeless principles we might be able to pull out there, but we need to understand the difference between descriptive and prescriptive. There's a lot of prescriptive things in scripture, isn't there? Do this, whenever you do this, do this in remembrance of me. If you remember, those are the ordinances. When we do baptism, when we do communion together, those are ordinances. We call those, they're prescriptive. Jesus gave them and he said, do this, do this. That's prescriptive, like a prescription, right? Don't neglect meeting with one another. There's a prescription, right? Go and make disciples. Is that prescriptive? Yeah, that's, that's a command, right? Here's another one. Love one another. By the way, that's not optional. That's prescriptive, meaning that this is God's order for us. It's an ordinance. Um, by the way, qualifications for elders and deacons, order in worship, there's structure that's given to us in the New Testament letters. So prescriptive. We need to understand then that some things in Scripture are time-bound. They're a time-bound command, but a good principle. For example, Ephesians 6, 18 through 19 says, Praying at all times in the Spirit with all prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints and also for me. Okay? 
that words may be given to me, this is Paul speaking, in opening my mouth boldly to proclaim the mystery of the gospel. How many of you have prayed for Paul today to make known the mystery of the gospel? Paul's not here. He's with Jesus, isn't he? So that's a time-fixed command. Paul was saying, pray for me in that time. But did you hear the timeless principle? Hey, pray for your leaders. Can I just say, please pray? Play, pray for your leaders. There's the timeless principle. Um, greet each other with a holy kiss. You guys remember that this morning? Anybody slipped that one up this morning? Right, and accidentally greeted somebody with an actual kiss. That's repeated over and over. So don't actually do that because it's not culturally, <laughs> you won't be received well culturally. But what's the principle there? What's the principle? Greet each other warmly. Greet each other warmly. Are you guys kind of seeing this? Um, the Bible records human sin. This doesn't justify or say we should do the things that they did, like David um, and the adultery, and he murdered a guy for his wife, Bathsheba. Don't do that. The Bible's not saying to do that. Um, so how do we, what's another way that we can uh, find out timeless principles? Well, how many of you can stop being Western American? Just stop it. Stop thinking like it. No, it's not easy, right? That's the, so there's this sense that we have a cultural bias. When we come to Scripture, um, we're a more individualistic culture than what was written to the original hearers. They were a much more collectivist culture, which meant that the group was more important than the indiv individual, okay? We still have some cultures like that. But for us, it is super helpful. I don't know if you've ever done this, but read the Bible with somebody who's not from your country, who doesn't speak your language, who doesn't have the same background as you do. And it's amazing the things that you were like, I missed that completely right? What if we sit down and read the Bible with people who are not like us, who have the same experiences or from the same cultural backgrounds? Then we gain timeless principles that we maybe would have missed because they're not a part of our culture. This is why we're encouraged to, to devote ourselves to the public reading of Scripture, to, be, uh, to read in community so as to gain greater, more accuracy to perspective includes believers from, by the way, all generations. Old folks, if you just have a Bible study full of old folks, are you going to get a younger perspective? No. Younger folks, if you just love to congregate around and you just like to be around people your own age, you're going to miss a perspective. And you're going to miss some of the nuances that speak to somebody who's more seasoned in life and in ministry, huh? So multiple generations, don't just read the Bible with people who are like you, other nations. And also, here's an interesting one, read the Bible with folks from history. What do I mean by that? Have you ever looked into some of the older writings from Christians or believers who've come in the past? That's helpful because there are certain things that have developed in the last 200 years that never existed before the last 200 years. And so it's really refreshing sometimes to see how people encountered the word of God before some of the systematic theologies that have come into place. Words like Calvinism, Arminianism that just inflame debate or things like dispensationalism versus covenant theology, right? Those two things are warring at each other. Those things didn't exist um, the, you know, before the last 300, 400 years. And so they change how we read the Bible, don't they? Okay, so read the Bible in community, in community with people who are not like you. We believe that the Bible should do, every, or so that Christians should do everything the Bible commands, not do anything the Bible forbids. And where the Bible is silent, work from biblical principles, conscience, wisdom, and godly counsel to determine what should and should not be done. Did AI exist in the time that the New Testament was written? We're in a new territory. The Bible doesn't say avoid artificial intelligence, or it doesn't say use artificial intelligence. So 
So we have to then use biblical principle and wisdom and godly counsel to figure out what do we do? This whole thing is weird. I don't know what to do with it. So last thing, how to read scripture. So we want to do it intentionally, which means on purpose. And I just want to leave, I know this is intensely practical. I'm not going to blow your hair back with this. Some of you just need a reminder. You remember what uh, Peter said to the churches? By way of reminder. So here's your pastor reminding you. Daily encounter God's word to read and reflect. Don't just read it. Reflect upon it. What do I mean by that? Our culture has robbed all of us from this thing called reflection, where we read and then we ask, how is our life matching up with what we're reading? How many of you spend time meditating on how your life is matching up with what the Word of God says? Because remember, you're really good at lying to yourself. Anybody think they're a good person? The Bible's there to tell you you're not and to remind you of reality. It's not going to blow your hair back. Um, but some of us, man, I, that's one of the most common responses I get. You know, I'm a good person. Why do I need God? Why don't you spend some time with the Bible, read and reflect and see? Because the word of God is a double-edged sword. It sees and knows us, doesn't it? So asking questions like this, am I obeying this scripture? If not, what would it look like to obey this scripture? We have uh, Jesus telling us, if you love me, you will obey my commands. If you love me, you'll obey my commands. So that's read and reflect. Now, church, here's where it gets corporate. Weekly, what if we were to gather and share? What if we were to gather and share? Here's the idea. The church is not supposed to be just one guy standing up and saying, here's the word of God. But what if we encountered God's voice all week and we got together and be like, you guys, you won't believe what God said to me in his word. How many of you came so excited to share what God said to you this week? Don't, don't just wait for me. What if you came and you're like, man, I can't wait to tell at least five people what he's told me this week. And I, I, I saw Lacey do that last week, right? She comes up, she's like, I cannot wait to show and tell my, my faith family what God is saying to me, what he's doing. Man, that would change up how we do Sunday, wouldn't it? It's not just come and sit in the pews and listen, but it would be come to share because you've been encountering God all week. So gather and share. And sharing is caring. <laughs> can we just quote that one? I don't know. The most important thing you can do for this church is encounter God and share what he says. That's the most, thing, the most important thing you can do as a member of our church is not just show up, not just volunteer, not just give money. If the only thing you do is sit down and encounter God all week and then share what God is saying to you through his word, that's the most important thing you can do for this church, brothers and sisters. Can I say that? And then yearly, plan and commit. Now here, our planners are all, uh, are all like, yes! But everybody else is like, ah, what do you mean by this, pastor? Well, yearly, you should have a plan and, and commit to a plan. You should have some goals for encountering God's word. Now, a lot of us maybe have heard, read the Bible in a year. Okay, that's great if you can do that. It usually takes me about two to three years to intentionally encounter God's word and, and in a way that it's in context. And so do you have a plan to do that? Where are my grade school kids? Where are my high school students? Where are the middle school students? Do you have a plan to have read the whole Bible by the time you graduate? If not, you should. The whole council of scripture is there before you. Do you have a goal to encounter it every day? If you've never read the Bible, anybody here um, read the whole Bible through? Yeah, there's a few hands. Way to go. There's no shame if you're not raising your hand. I'm not bringing about shame, but here's an encouragement. Set a goal. You're not going to accidentally read the whole Bible. Like go to sleep and wake up and be like, oh man, I got it, God. You got to do it. You got to do it. You got to do it. 
set a plan to do it. Set a Bible reading plan. I I, I was going to show you this. Let me see if I can. Um, oh, there you guys can see a copy of my notes. But I love to use the U version. I know it's simple. It's accessible to everybody. But you can go into the, if you've got a phone, everybody can download a Bible for free in any version that you want. And you can even see that your pastor's missed a couple of days or at least Mark in a couple of days here. But it gives you a Bible reading plan. Um, and by the way, there's this awesome little function that says, catch me up. And then you can shift dates forward and continue reading, not skipping, but you can continue to read the Bible so you're not missing. Remember, it's not a sprint. You don't want to just get it done. You want to understand the whole counsel of God's word. And so you can go and you can pick a Bible plan that will, it will even give you dates. It will organize you. Anybody need that level of organization? Yes, big time. I'm scatterbrained, as you can probably tell, right? So I have a year and commit, commit to that plan. Yearly, commit to that plan. See how you're doing with that plan. Do you need to reestablish? Maybe some of you need to do this monthly. And I want to leave you with this then today. Numbers 11, 26 through 29. I want you to hear this. And I've told you about this before, but Moses' desire was for everybody to be able to have access to God like he had access to God, okay? Can you imagine if we had a congregation full of Moseses? Did you know that that was Moses' greatest desire and God's greatest excitement to answer? Because we all have access to God on the level that Moses did. But here, Moses' desire here. Now, two men remained in the camp, one named Eldad and the other named Medad, and the spirit rested on them. And they were among those registered, but they had not gone out to the tent, and so they prophesied in the camp. And a young man ran and told Moses, Eldad and Medad are prophesying in the camp. And Joshua, the son of Nun, the assistant of Moses from his youth said, my Lord Moses, stop them. What does Moses say? But Moses said to him, are you jealous for my sake? Would that all the Lord's people were prophets, that the Lord would put his spirit on them. Oh, that the Lord would speak to all of his people, brothers and sisters, you have the voice of God. We have a congregation that have the same access to God that Moses had. That should send tingles down your spine. There's power in God's word if we encounter it intentionally. And I'll tell you, it's God's power for salvation. If we get into the book and we encounter the power, people are going to get saved. And Fremont is going to get changed. Brothers and sisters, can we do this together? I'm going to pray for us. Lord Jesus, I pray that we would be a people of the book. And Lord, I pray that if there's somebody here who has not heard your voice through your word in such a precious and an amazing way, Lord, I pray that even today would be the day of their salvation. Holy Spirit, that you would speak to them through your word, God. That you would go to work on us as a church, that we would not just wait for one person or one man or one leader, but that we would go straight to the throne room of God. God, I pray for every person here, big, little, small, old, different cultures, different I pray for the reservation, God, and the the native people. Lord, I pray, God, that they would be able to encounter you through Jesus, that they would be saved and hear your voice, God, and we pray that your power would go out for salvation. In Jesus' name, amen. Brothers and sisters, I'm so thankful you're here. Go pick up your Bible and get ready to have your hair blown, blown away. Thank you. Go in Jesus' name.